God our Father, we come before you thanking you for the blessings of this day and the blessings of every day. We ask that you be present to us here, helping us to be truly mindful of how you are within us and within each person gathered here. In this season of gifts, we call upon you to give us the wisdom that we need to come to true understanding of all that's brought before us. Give us the courage that we need to make the decisions that are for the good of all, and especially the patience to arrive at true understanding be with us during this time, bless us, and bless all the people that we serve. To this prayer and to every prayer, we say, Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any additions to the agenda? <coughs> I do have an addition I put in front of you. It's a, a letter from Cindy Friesen requesting the use of this weapon pool to the PE program August 25th and 29th. I'd like to add that to the consent. Second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Motion carries five. Are there any other additions to the agenda? Second. Is there any further discussion on the consent agenda? Kyle Andrew with HD Supply Waterworks representing Census Metering. And uh, Mel asked me to come here and give you a little bit of. Uh, still one short? No. A little bit of uh, information and background on the uh, future of metering systems, electric and water. Uh, what uh, the world calls a smart grid now, AMI, advanced metering infrastructure. And then there is also AMR, which we call automatic meter reading, which is typically a drive-by radio read or a walk-by radio read. And uh, all the advances in technology that is out there. And without my PowerPoint in front of me, I'll use yours. <laughs> I'm going to uh, go through this pretty quick so I don't hold you up too long, because usually I end up with a lot of questions. Uh, that are easier to answer in the foreground. This is uh, the iPearl meter, which uh, to give you an idea, that is the hottest thing going right now. It has no moving parts. It is guaranteed 100% accurate or new meter accuracy 99 to 101 for 20 years or they replace it. When you get the replacement, you get a new meter. Uh, you will find spec sheets in there showing you how accurate it is to give you an idea. It's near perfect down to a three hundredth of a gallon, which is uh, if you could take water and fill the bottom of, a, let's say, a shot glass, small glass, it would barely cover the bottom. Then you have to be able to take that water and you have to be able to pour it out of that glass over an entire minute. Now. No human's capable of doing that, but that can measure that low of flow. <clears throat> so what it does is it's creating revenue. It's uh, helping you with uh, issues with uh, accountability for water loss with the state. And the warranty is uh, virtually untouchable. It can take a freeze. Uh, it is possible to break them, but usually by torquing. I have had none freeze yet. It is uh, designed so that you can excuse me, I'll pop that open. You can physically read it, like a direct read. You can touch read with it. You can hook a radio to it and radio read. And you can hook some, a few other manufacturers' radios to it. Then uh, 
within that next page is there's a next thing coming on uh, commercial meters you're going to find the pages that say omni right there what you usually got with the large meter was you could get all of their high flow take for instance the school <clears throat> when there's a ball game going on you're metering that water uh, this particular meter is going to now get the janitor at the drinking fountain in the evening it, whereas large meters typically wouldn't roll until you had a pretty decent flow through them so what it's de designed to do is uh, get your accuracy and increase your revenue for you with the way that uh, if you were to automate your system right now you would be getting and you wanted to keep your meters in place that are say five years or newer to use the life out of them you've been using census meters so what you would do is you would take the direct read meet, uh, register off of that meter that's on there and you would get this we call it a retrofit and this piece here the top AMR register would hook to it and turn it to touch read, radio read, etc. And so you can use the life up of what you currently have in there. Um, and this is already an obsolete register from what you get. The uh, newest ones are actually electronic with a 20 year warranty on the register, too. So the radio that goes with that is everything with census is plug and play. Um, you just plug it in and you program it. This comes through the lid right there, is on the surface. So the antenna sticking through there. It's a sealed unit. Uh, so it could be flooded in water. This can be flooded in water. This can be flooded. They can be muddy. Everything else, unless somebody damages this, uh, it's a 20 year guarantee also on the radio. Now, this is an example of our electric meter. Uh, doesn't look like much with no electricity on it. it. Would look similar to some of your others that you're using right now. Census makes their own residential electric meters. They do outsource their polyphase or three-phase meters by the use of putting their radio in a GE, a Landis and Gear, an Elster, and uh, I think there's another brand out there they match up with. The accuracy is tremendous. They uh, follow the same warranty that everybody else does on electric gear, electric meters. It's a one-year warranty, but you know, unless something happens, a uh, storm or something causes damage, they don't go bad and they uh, hold their accuracy. Now, when you're talking radio read, you have, there's a lot of confusion out there. If I have my piece of reading equipment, my transceiver, be it a handheld, a drive-by unit, or a fixed base station, that can only talk to, my census transceiver can only talk to a census radio. ITRON's transceiver can only talk to an ITRON, etc. It's an FCC thing. You can't, I can't read somebody else's and they can't read mine. Now, you can, however, so you're proprietary. You are not necessarily proprietary on the meter you use. So down the road, uh, you could possibly, and there's a list in there I believe I gave you, of water meters that Census has approved that you can hook up to their radio and make their radio read that water meter. Uh, in the same sense, you could probably, uh, within a certain uh, club or association, you could pick your electric meter if you didn't want the census and have the census radio put in it. The census is currently, it's not that well known in middle America, it's currently the largest electric uh, supplier, meter supplier in the world. And of the other main contenders, at least it says roughly around 15% of their product is being built with census radio in it. The reason for that is because everybody's pushing to the AMI, the smart grid. Census is kind of the king of that. Others are catching up. The reason, and they always will, and the census stays ahead of it. We call it FlexNet. Um, they put all their eggs in that basket several years ago when everybody else uh, said, oh, AMI will never fly. <laughs> the reason they did it is they knew things had come along with the smart grid. This is designed to be able to actually, this meter, 
this radio, and whether you use FlexNet or not, this is actually designed to be able to charge somebody in the future, uh, time of use if you want it to on water. Uh, you'll, be, you'll be able to time of use that. You know, I, all of these things are, are reality. We're running out of water, we're running out of resources, and so uh, those will become a need someday. What FlexNet does that's different is all of their radios, this one and this one, is a two watt. It is a private frequency. They, um, they assign it to you. It's not shared. It is a private frequency, so nobody can be on it. And so what it is, is it's like me talking in this room. I can lower my voice and y'all can still hear me because it doesn't hear anything else. It doesn't hear the chatter of the other RF frequencies. Um, and then they also have two watt radios, which everybody else is one watt and below about half of what your cell phone is. <clears throat> so they're using that combined power and that private frequency to be able to do this. And what their fixed base is is a true uh, communication between, if you put an antenna up here on your water tower, between each meter and the tower. In other words, it doesn't do what they call the mesh. It doesn't hop uh, communication from one meter to the other until it gets back to the repeater that sends it to your database. It's a direct communication from like uh, mommy to baby boy each time. And uh, so that's why that data comes back so clear and uh, it, it's almost <coughs> limited. It's, it's insane the amount of information you can get back on electric and water right now if you want it. Uh, there will be some pages in there at the back I think I threw in uh, for the logic software that's out. Maybe I didn't. <laughs> anyway, the, the software that's out there will help you create all the reports you need to on your electric and your water. The, uh, the way that FlexNet works is you have a tower we call a base station. Then you have an RNI, regional network interface, and that would be like your computer servers. And then you have your endpoints. Okay, the communication from the endpoint uh, this holds 30 days of information. Every time it talks to it, like every five hours a day, it sends seven days of backhaul. So if there happened to be a truckload of nuclear waste parked over the top of one of these and it couldn't get communication for three days, when it pulls off of that and it communicates with that radio, it has seven days of backlog. You haven't missed one bit of data off of it. <clears throat> then the tower holds, uh, I believe, Three, 30 days and your RNI holds 13 months. <clears throat> the latest thing that Census is really doing is, is, and that's what those back pages were, I forgot the order I put it in, is they're doing what they call software as a service. You won't buy your RNI anymore and you won't have it here because you might not have an IT person that can take care of it. They host it over the web, you have your tower, they fix it remotely. If there's updates, it's in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, I believe. They do the updates. They get on and do the maintenance. If a server needs replaced down the road, um, which is going to happen, I have some of these that are sold that uh, everybody's still happy with, but they're wanting this new software push that's in there, and their servers won't hold it. You know, thing, technology outgrows itself uh, very rapidly. And so what the hosting does is it puts that responsibility in Census Lab, and uh, they have a fee that comes along with it, but you don't have to take care of anything. If lightning strikes that server, they own it. It's their problem. If lightning strikes it here, you own it, and it's your problem. Haven't had any of that ever happen yet, but we do live in Kansas. It is a possibility. <coughs> then, oh, go ahead. Well, I'm just, what, what part of that interfaces with our billing software? Uh, they have yet to fail to interface with anybody's billing software. It is the billing software's respons responsibility in the cities to a certain degree, but they communicate with them and tell them exactly what they need to make this mesh up and act together. Um, we've put that on with a billing company that has one customer, and they made it work. One customer in the whole U.S. <laughs> so. So they're, they're pretty flexible about what they do. 
uh, give you an idea of what you can do with uh, FlexNet also, fixed base. Census makes their own street lights. Their LED and their, uh, oh, what's the other one that's uh, efficient? Something magic. <laughs> anyway, anyway, these street lights are operated off of FlexNet, so you can use them to, uh, uh, you could turn your street lights on by time, the radio instead of your photo cell. The radio tells it when to turn on, uh, which they do last longer than a photo cell. They've proven <laughs> the radio does. It tells it when to turn on. It tells it when to dim. Like let's say 2 a.m. We want to shut those street lights to half power to save energy. It tells them when to dim. You can have it triggered to uh, the police station, and if there is a uh, uh, tornado. Instead of relying totally on your uh, sirens, you could actually have your street lights flashing off and on emergency signals. Uh, it's it's unlimited what they do. They have uh, controls to work substations. Uh, they're talking about hosting other people's software through their system. Customer Connect. You know, it's just uh, pretty wild. Everything you can get with. Fixed space and flex net. Now, I'm going to work backwards. That's the top end of the picture. The, at the beginning of the picture is always this, this, and this. These all have an M in their model number. The M stands for migratable. They designed this private frequency so that you could use, you can direct read it, uh, this, but it has a radio no matter if you want it or not. Okay, you can add this later if you get a handheld that will read the radios, and you could be reading this and this with a handheld. Then the next step that's even more efficient and effective and faster is a true drive-by unit, and it's just a uh, it's a server that's a stronger transceiver that you put in your pickup and you drive around. And sincerely, if you were to start it up right out here side of City Hall, the first thing you do is look at the map to see where you need to drive because it's probably knocked off about six square blocks. And you're probably going to make one loop around town. And the only meters that aren't going to, that are still going to be there is ones that have a problem in the radio that need attention. And you can go by and do a direct read there and enter it. Uh, the other thing you can do with the drive-by unit, <coughs> remote disconnect. Uh, you can do this with fixed space uh, incredibly easy. Uh, bang, a button out of your billing system, and they're off. Okay, for not paying their bill. To turn it back on, there's always safety factors. So what you'll do is you'll be doing a, a situation they call arming the meter. They come in, they pay their bill, you're going to arm the meter. Still doesn't have power to their house. They can take any remote control, any infrared device, and point it at their meter at that time, and it will finish. The clue there is that you know the owner's home before that power comes on, just in case they left something on top of the stove. Uh, and that's a, that's a, there's different types of safety protocol you can put in place for that. <laughs> By the end of this year, uh, the future's coming into this, where it's remote shutoff. It'll be internal in the meter. Uh, it again will be a manual turn on because you don't know if they left the tub open and left the drain closed and you don't want to buy somebody's house. So you can remotely shut it off, but you do have to go there uh, with the handheld device so that that meter knows you're right there to see if the water is going to continue running or shut off. So there will be safety steps put in all of that. Now, with the remote disconnect and the remote disconnect, you will also be able to do that with a drive-by unit or a handheld. The catch is you can't do that while you're in route. While you're reading, which you probably wouldn't be anyway, it's going to be a week later that you're going to get disconnects or two weeks, then you will go out with a separate file. There's five meters, and all you have to do is drive within, say, a half a block of them and just uh, you'll be looking at your laptop or your handheld and it'll tell you when it triggered it off <laughs> and you would turn it back on the same way. <clears throat> so the top end is AMI where virtually everything's controlled right here and it gives you 
graphs and pictures and proof when somebody comes in and, and you it's a big customer service too because you'll be able to tell them we think you have a water leak you need to check it out you haven't stopped running at least two gallons an hour continuous for three days that's not normal okay so you're doing the customer service at times um, I've had landlords think it was the greatest thing in the world because they got a bill or they got it excuse me a uh, a leak notice from the city when they had an accountant paying their bills and didn't even think the water was on to this particular building. So it can be a service to you in a lot of ways and it can be a service to, to the community in, in a large way. Uh, the only thing that you have that, that changes is you have daily warnings, daily information with AMI. With drive-by, you could say it's monthly. Now you could choose to read twice a month because it won't take you very long and one of those would just be uh, looking for alarm read and the other one would be looking for alarm and sending the billing and uh, with handheld you could do it too but more than likely you won't gather all that advantage <laughs> but the, the secret is is whatever you put in from handheld read I ha and then you decide you want to go to drive by I've wasted no money everything I have in the ground and in my uh, building is still used and then from drive-by everything is still used for fixed space so you can scale that as you go along when you say handheld are you touch read or enter the number read uh, no handheld it's it's uh, there, there's two devices one's a transceiver and one's just a little handheld like you would use with touch reading uh, you've seen them before for route do you use them at all no, no? okay that you can manual enter or with ours you can use it to radio read and what it is is it's sending out the same signal to this to receive it and uh, it works pretty effectively but keep in mind that transceiver isn't as powerful because it's fitting here versus the drive-by it's just getting more power to get the signal out and get it back versus fixed base, which is a huge amount of power and control over it. But, uh, but you wouldn't be looking at the number and entering it, the electronics would do that? No, you. yeah. Okay. Here, here's, here's, here's kind of the way it works. If you were to step outside here and your whole town was this way with a handheld because we're Kansas and we're kind of flat and kind of clear, uh, you would probably step out here, especially with your electric meters, and you would hit that to start reading and it would just start gathering them at random. And most people that are doing this are actually using it as like what I call a semi-drive-by. They're staying in their pickup, and they stop, and they let it read until it quits. And then they move a couple blocks away, and they do this. And then they, they just kind of zigzag around. When they're done, it'll say that you've read, uh, let's, say, uh, eight, let's say you have 800 endpoints. It'll say that I've read 780 of 800 endpoints, and you can just tell it to search and tell you the addresses it didn't read. You may go back by there and it'll read them, or it may be an issue that you got to get out and manually enter it. But while they're there, they can look to see what the issue is and manually enter it, so when they bring it back to you, it's ready to drop your billing file. And uh, that will give you uh, a certain amount of alarms. Uh, the beauty about this meter and the Omni meter is uh, to show you how primitive you can start, I can take the radio clear out of this picture and uh, you could have one little component that goes with a laptop. Uh, we call it a puck, it's about this big. And you take it and you lay it right there against that. And it's on your laptop and it'll read and communicate with the, the iPearl and the Omnimeter, the large meter I was telling you about. These, they're actually computers. They're storing 30 days right over all the time of hourly reads so I can take a directory I have directory customers that have just that component and when somebody complains about their bill they go download it and it'll show them you never quit using water or you use 10,000 gallons on this Saturday it's just information to arm you with and a lot of times it really helps them to realize hey I, I do have a, a leaky toilet I do have something going on and uh, you know brings their attention to it uh, one of the first places we got a call when we put one of these in that I, I went out as a service to them and downloaded the information for them was a church. And I said, man, you're, you're using five gallons every hour, except on Sunday you use more. <laughs> and they go, well, we know we have leaks. 
okay, well, you didn't fix it. Well, until you put that meter in, though, nobody ever, the bill was always the same <laughs> because the meter wasn't catching them, <laughs> okay? Well, then that meter went in, and that showed them uh, their water loss went like this. And, of course, the, this church um, called a plumber really quick to fix everything because they had that many small leaks, and the old meter wasn't catching it, and the new one was. But the greatest thing was is you were armed with that information. They are going to be putting this in for direct read customers, a, a firmware soon that will allow them to, instead of going hourly, uh, they have to stretch it out to two hour reads, which will still give you quite a bit of that information, but they'll be able to do it over 90 days, so you can download 90 days of information out of this. So all, all of that technology is there, and I'm not too sure with a handheld, you couldn't do it with that puck, but with a handheld, I think you can draw some of the information out of this. The difference between electric and water is they're going to program this to store information you ask them to, okay? And it could be changed later, but the amount of information that he could ask for that, that's capable of storing is unspeakable. And uh, it, it takes, like when you're using a radio frequency, it takes a wide bandwidth to draw all that information out of the Any any questions? I know I probably talked too long already. I was trying to speed along. Took a sheet in here and tells us any costs or anything like that. <laughs> Actually, what I was going to say, how many water meters do we currently have? Oh, I can't remember. Well, I've got a list. Yep, yep. It'd be, it'd be last year's. It was just averaged off of last year's. I, I used, uh, in, in 2010, oh. I used a figure of 600 and 600, 600 electric No, mine's water. just on electric meters, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. What do you show for electric? 653 residentials in average for 2013 and 168 average of commercial meters. But now, not all those commercial meters will be three-phase or polyphase right. meters. Some of them will be... Will just be will 2S. Be, they'll just yeah. be... You know, like like Kevin's shop is just a single phase meter. He has no three phase, and some of these don't. So that's just one of those we'll have to count out of the meter book in order to tell. I had the, the sheet mail too. I just didn't write it down. I, I'll give you a. a I'm going to give you a ballpark. Okay, this isn't a bid. <laughs> I uh, I crunched some numbers in uh, 2010. It looks like June of 2010 for Mel, and he just rattled off, I believe, because I mixed some of this in. I put in some uh, polyphase meters, some 2S meters, and uh, 20 remote disconnect meters that you could shut off. And I put in 700 electric meters, and I put in 600 water meters and radios, assuming all but 10 of the 600 were residential meters, which they can be, but it'll give you a close figure. I. Uh, Within this ballpark that I gave him was an owned system where you would have had your RNI here. Uh, and what does that mean, RNI? Uh, regional MP servers. Okay. We'll, we'll call them servers. Okay. That's what I just like. They call these things MHUs, I call them radios. Okay. Uh, the entire thing and the programming pack, everything you needed, installed by a contractor from us, managed by us, uh, was was a, a grand total rough figure, because these numbers aren't right, of about 455, 455,000. That was everything new, okay, and, and flex now. I took a quote off of a similar town I just did recently, to give you an idea that has real close 570 water, so a little bit more, uh, roughly about the same. Uh, six, about 730 electric of different forms, and that figure was that their in-house servers too, or was that? No, that was hosted. 
Uh, okay. And that figure was uh, about 430. So you see that's what happens to technology, it's already come down. Now the catch to that was, that's hosted. So they're not buying part of that equipment. Okay, the other thing was is I had a year of hosting fee in there, so it's kind of about a balance. If you look at your back pages when you have time to study them, what the hosting does is, is I'll, I'll give you an idea, because I wrote this down before I came. This is uh, something that took my breath away the first time it was offered until I had somebody that wanted it. The $22,000 annually. Okay? That's, that, for that hosting. Equi that's for hosting. <laughs> you don't buy as much up front, but, but and any upgrades they take care of. And that's why I put those pages in showing you the hosting, what all it includes, because it actually does come with quite a bit of insurance. Um, that comes to eighteen thirty a month for you, and using a guest figure, which it looks like I'm really close on electric meters and water meters, that comes to about a dollar fifty a meter to read. Um, a lot of times, AMIs added in to the uh, service charge if you wanted to do that or, or not. Uh, that would be totally a election or decision by you, but that gives you the breakdown of what it costs per meter to read. Now, all of these things are always uh, coming down to give you an idea of where the drive-by would hit on okay, exactly. So that's with the tower. That's, that's the top that's of the, the line. magic. Okay. That's the magic system. If you did all of the same endpoints, endpoints I'm calling meters, Every, all of that equipment the same except without the tower and a drive-by unit you would be at about four that number can't be right there it is uh, about 350 354 and does that have an annual fee that has an annual fee that's down around 3,000 so uh, it's quite a bit of different it's a different in the information you get but like I said you could use your drive-by um, you you could go out with it a couple three times because you're not hurting the radios. Keep in mind the warranty on these radios uh, with Census is uh, designed. They love people that are doing walk by and drive by because that meter isn't get, that radio isn't getting hit very much, and they got a 20 year guarantee on it. It's designed with that guarantee around fixed space, getting hit five times a day every day, 365 days a year for 20 years. So that gives you an idea how uh, substantial their equipment is. With council's permission, what I'd like to do is sit down with Jeff and Mel and, and John at the appropriate time and sit down and figure out exactly what we need in terms of numbers and pull all the information together and then meet with Mr. Unruh to kind of get a little bit better number or idea of the numbers we we'll would be looking at and then come back to you guys with more solid numbers. You also said that you uh, that it improves efficiency and it increases revenue. Uh, yeah, Have yeah. you done any studies that you can well you the dollar amounts to this or is this just uh, Oh yeah, oh yes. Yes. It's it's uh, oh, especially on the water side. side. Something like that. Especially on the water side. Now electricity your worst electric meter is still pretty efficient in comparison to a water meter. The, even the old, uh, what were they, gear driven? Uh, yeah, the mechanical. Yeah, they. And we still have a lot of mechanical. It, it takes a long time for those to lose efficiency, but then you have to look at it like I didn't care how much gasoline my 4x4 used when I was paying 90 cents a gallon. Okay, uh, by the time I was 20. I didn't like that truck anymore you know, uh, because of the price of fuel. So you have to look at it, uh, is, is one or two or three percent of electricity equate to quite a bit of money? It, it can. Uh, that's why I, I'm a big advocate on those commercial meters, um, whether it would be a, a school or, or some facility that would run a lot of low flow but needs a big meter. Uh, that commercial meter could actually create you more revenue, even though it costs you more to put in, 
could pay for itself and uh, turn itself around in probably six months versus a small meter just because of the amount of water that goes through them. So then you take all your small meters and you say, uh, oh, that meter's accurate, big deal, it's going to cost me, it's going to cost Kyle maybe a dollar a month more. But you take that times 600, you take that times 6,000 in a town, and a lot of people it's going to be more than a dollar, and uh, it, it, it turns into revenue really quick. And uh, that, that's, that's the key thing to making something pay for itself as you turn the revenue around. Your biggest gain there will be your water, because water is mechanical and everybody knows how corrosive water is. It works on those parts in that meter the same as it works on your faucet. Uh, they, lose, they lose accuracy on low flow by mileage really bad. Uh, one that's running an irrigation is going to be pretty accurate. But if you took that same meter and all of a sudden you started trickling water through a hose through it, it it's probably not even turning. Uh, so you're giving water away. So the other thing that's a key factor with water is, uh, I don't know how your town is, but uh, do you base a sewer rate on water usage in the winter? Yes. Almost all water usage in the winter outside of a shower is low flow. So if you can get 5% more water showing up in the winter, that means 5% more for the sewer, which is typically needed. Uh, you know, most town, none of us like to pay bills, but uh, it is a reality that that money is needed to keep that sewer plant running uh, up to EPA standards and everything like that. It, it's expensive, and uh, so it, it can bring revenue in, in in two or three different ways. So do you, do you actually have some results on paper to show like a given town I, I can what get, it was doing before I can and what get it, it for after? you. I can get it for you, and I have references. Uh, we have, uh, I have five in in Kansas myself. Uh, one of them, the, the most similar in size to you, I would say, would be uh, uh, Medicine Lodge. Uh, they've been fixed base, 100% Iperl and Omni now for a year and a half, two years. And uh, they had an uh, incredible uh, water loss and it trimmed off, I don't want to say the percentage because I'm not really sure it was, it was verbal, but it, it was substantial. Their water loss looks really good to the state now. And that was just on changing meters. <clears throat> would so, be interesting to see some of them. I mean, oh yeah, I mean, and uh, I, could, I, could, to, to, I could actually, I have places that I could arrange for you to visit if you wanted to see the software and see stuff work. Uh, I could also arrange for you to visit with somebody that was uh, just doing drive-by and just doing handheld. Uh, I think you could probably skip the handheld and go to the drive-by because it give you kind of the same information. Uh, but keep in mind that everything you do can be built on. If you just bought some electric meters today, have really read them, uh, and three years from now you got a handheld, they're ready to read. Same thing if you put the water meters in the ground that's making the money and then you can add that radio to the water meter later because that water meters that's 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 my revenue and the electric meter is my revenue so remember to start at the bottom and everything can migrate up and be built on it doesn't have to uh, it doesn't have to be a full-blown project thank you You're done with me thank you sir thanks thanks okay
concentration. I have reviewed all the material that you sent me uh, involving this piece of property, which I understand the issue is that presently that property is owned by one of the council members, Mr. Davis, and that there's been some questions raised about whether or not his acquisition of that property or anything done with regard to that property has created problems for the city or a violation of the conflict of interest statute governing city council members. I have reviewed all of the materials, the timeline, involving how this property went, the condemnation, when Mr. Davis's company acquired his interest in it, the contracts that were made with previous landowners. I've interviewed the previous landowner, I've talked to Mr. Davis, I've talked to the neighbors, which I understand had some concerns about it, Jenny Jones, uh, and I have researched the statute, and it is my conclusion that there has been no violation of the conflict of interest statute by Mr. Davis. And there certainly is no exposure or problem on the part of the city with anything that's been done. I think there may have been some misconceptions about how it went down and who owned what at one time, at what time, but at no time that the city council has entered into a contract on that property did Mr. Davis or his company own the property. Uh, it was owned by the All Bears prior to that when those deals were made. Mr. Davis has said that he has acquired the property and will pay for the cleanup costs, which is a benefit to the city because selling that lot probably wouldn't bring enough to do that if it was sold at auction. Um, so I don't see anyone has benefited inappropriately by this. I don't see any violation of the statutes and I see no liability on the part of the city. And it is my, uh, I've been requested and I will be sending a letter to the mayor outlining this in writing that can be free to be given to the public if you want to. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, your superintendent's report. Okay. One thing I, I want to bring up and ask, uh, we are done with the water project, all the final paperwork has been signed, uh, and just wanted to see if the council, I spoke with the mayor about this as far as setting up an open house for the public, uh, we still wanted to do that. So, the engineer said that they would be willing to come up, but, you know, and if you want to do that, go ahead. I think it would be a good idea. I think the community would like an opportunity to see what their money was spent on and maybe get a chance to talk to the engineers about how the process works and that kind of thing. I was thinking a Tuesday or Thursday evening between like 4 and 7 or 4 and 8 p.m. to allow people an opportunity to be off of work and actually have time to go through it. If council is a group. Maybe a couple of days so that when you talk to the engineers, make sure that they're so maybe June 26th or June 24th or July 1st. We need to go into the front. Okay. Is that okay with everybody's one? All right. Sailor, 
um, also I had was the lease agreement um, when I sent the packets for the catalytic converters. We had a hundred thousand, a hundred plus a little bit um, encumbered, and the total bill. I have visited with Steve Bonner the last two years while we've been waiting on this project to actually um, take place and um, he sent us this information and it's just a matter of you guys approving the lease and then I'll go ahead and do the rest of the paperwork and the mayor can sign it. Are there any prepayment penalties that you choose to try and have offer? Or is there any discussion from council? What was the total? It shows 114,300 is our principal balance. Starting. So we had 100,000 that we paid. Yeah, 110 something. It was an October. So, so the total bill was roughly 225,000? Right. Which, yeah, I was going to say, I think we. Uh, that to be paid. That was fair when we contracted them to go ahead and do the work. $224,735. And that was what the total bill was? That was, yeah. Well, that was the contract. Did it come in at contract amount? Of course, I know Jeff Dad didn't have any different. Didn't make any changes. So. Yeah, it came in at contract amount. So we put a hundred and. I called Steve needing this amount of money for our lease. Okay, so yeah, but we paid a hundred and ten thousand four hundred. Thirty-five dollars. We haven't yet. Are we going we'll to make the full payment with after we get the money from the lease? So, are you looking for a motion to approve the lease or anything? And then, of course, the so moved. Fair base. Second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. I believe they've got it in their package, do they not? Yes. yes. I would have to look at it and see if that's what they want. That brings it up to $100 per animal per incident, eliminates the uh, uh, licensing fee, and leaves the other the same. And I think that will get us to the point where we can, in our discretionary, with the police and the judge, to, uh, I'm just not saying what we're going to get everybody with, but that keeps it pretty simple. And, Hopefully, it gets where you want to be. At least it gives me an ability to, to create, if somebody's really a, a habitual offender, to put some pressure on them. Stop. So, what would the fine be for somebody that was a first time offender and they walked through? Probably, probably just a warning from the police. And we, that's discretionary. Uh, I, it could be this. Okay. Depending on what the situation is. But, it's, but this would be the most it can be. The way it is right now, the most it can be is 10 bucks. Right. Well, that's just a nuisance. So, in, in, in life, whatever the police decide to do on their ticket. On a discretionary basis, first time offender, or uh, comes in before the judge and I, we can look at the situation and do what we think is equity in the community. But if, it, but if it's a situation where they basically tell you, I don't care, and I'm going to do what I want to do with my dog, and it's going to be, well, you know, it's okay. Probably got to be the back. If they're saying, "Well, it got away from us," and we're sorry, and court costs, and you're probably off. Uh, I have a the only thing I was on this kennel uh, license, and we do have some zoning requirements where you would have to abide by those as far as where a kennel would be allowed. And I don't know if the state they may be a, you know for them to to give a kennel license. 
would have to have some assurance that it was within the city's zoning regulations because you can't have a kennel just anywhere. So that, I don't know how you want to address that. Well, I think that does abide by the license requirements of the state of Kansas. But so I don't, I, I'm just guessing, and I don't know, Rod, you correct me. Uh, and state perhaps we could add and the city zoning. Code. Yeah, we could add that. Yeah. And any city, they've got to comply with any city zoning. That's that right. 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 That take care of it. Now we're not going to do the metering deal any farther than what Kyle did when he was here. We'll skip that part of it. Uh, we did test the stacks last week as per KDHE. Uh, the lady that does the monitoring from Farabee's was here. We generated for a day and a half. Uh, stack emissions reduction of 90% on the Cooper, 93% on the Fairbanks, 98% on the Caterpillar. So the catalytic converters are doing their job. We'll have a good report to send to the state at the end of the month. Uh, it takes about 30 days to get the paperwork back from them on the book that she'll put together that we show to the KDHE inspector when they come by. We have to file twice a year and, and let them know what we've generated, how much we've generated, and that type of stuff. So uh, the bookwork into that is done. Uh, the only other thing I have is that the Caterpillar and, and I guess in the time that I was gone from here, why the contracts changed, which I knew they had with Midwest Energy, and we no longer can peak shave, which means in the summertime we had a base load that we were guaranteed, and then we could we could shave off the top of it and, and cheapen up our, our demand in the summer. Consequently, when that Caterpillar engine was put in in the 90s, that's what it was designed to do and it was designed to work strictly off the computer. We had no control over it. It started itself, it put itself on, it took itself off. Well now, running it as a base load engine or as a load sharing engine, we cannot do. It's designed strictly to work through the computer and the computer only. And so I've been in contact with Midstates, who did the original part of it, and they're recommending some updates. The, the engine, the controls on the engine are all electronic compared to mechanical on the others. And this engine will not load share without being uh, removed from the way that it's tied down on that computer now. So they want to put some inputs in, redo the software in the computer, and make it so that it would run with any of the other engines. And the cost of the cards to to take the inputs are about $1,500 and then the labor to uh, do the adjustments and that stuff and I talked to Mike Smarter from Mid States today he said he thought that two days worth of labor they usually charge $85 an hour plus travel expenses uh, he didn't think over over a maximum of two days they could have it straightened out if it's any different than that why I'll come back and let you know but that's they want to do a little bit more investigating because we can't control the load on this engine at this time because it's trying it's trying to see trying to see what the computer's telling it to do, but it can't see what the panel board's doing. So it's kind of one of these tug of war deals that somebody has to stay there and, and hold the load on it all the time, which we did the other day so that we could pass our stack. But um, it needs to be set up like the other engines so it can be run with either one of the other engines or black started by itself. So. Did he give you any idea what we were looking at in terms of travel costs? Oh, they just, they're in Salina. I mean, you know, if he stays so he all night, we, yeah, we'd have an overnight deal. You know, he usually stays out here, so, in meals and that stuff. I would say, you know, unless it's different than, than Mike and I think it is, it's going to figure about uh, probably a maximum of $1,000 a day, I would think, 10 hours to 12-hour day. They usually work 12-hour days. 
you know, it may go faster, may go slower, who knows. The software's been in there for over 20 years. It controls it, so I'm sure there's some updates to go with it, too. And the computer that runs is 20 years old. And I've talked to Randy about maybe the, the chance of replacing it so that we don't lose. It controls everything else on the panel board. But he told me that we could put a regular tower in there, and he'd provide us one for about five to six hundred dollars, so we wouldn't be out very much there either. So it's a it's a fairly reasonable fix to a problem that's been ongoing. So I guess basically what we're looking for is authorization to spend up to. About $5,000, no more than 5000 I would say that it should not, you know, I would say not over three or 3500 but five would sure give us some room. Well, I was thinking about adding with, the with the new With the new tower and that stuff, yeah, I think so. To do the computer upgrades on the cat and to make it to where it will load share with the other units that are down there. Second. Second. Is there any further discussion? All is that, Jeff, if they do that, is that going to be, it won't no longer be able to come off and run off the computer and start electronic? It'll have to be put on there. It can't go by itself, which we can't do now anyway. Midwest Energy won't let us do it. And we can't, we can't even set the amount of load without putting somebody in front of that panel board to hold it. It, it doesn't see everything else that's going on, and so consequently with having an electronic governor and the other two being mechanical, it fights all the time to take the full amount of load. It doesn't have droop in it like the other engines do where you can control the amount of load it will take. So that's where the, that's where the problem lies is that it's it's completely reactive. It has a different kind of control on it than a regular governor. It has what they call a D-slick, which, which is a combination governor and a load sharing panel is what it is. So it was designed to share load through the computer only. Otherwise, the only way you could use it was to put it on by itself in a dark plant and use it to bring your plant up. Because this time of year, if we can't share it with something else, it's really no more than just a generator to get the lights turned on in the plant until we can start another engine. That's all it is. This way, if we get it fixed, it should run and share with the other two that we have. for a year of planning on 
what you're going to do. And then second phase is implementation. And that's the bigger amount of money where you can get money for constructing actual infrastructure. Um, I know that Sydney was here last time with someone from the EDS, EDH, EDH. Um, who's done some work with the city before and has, through their firm, done some other safe rest school projects around the state. Um, I think we presented it to you that the first phase wouldn't have any expense to the city and there was, I think, some miscommunication on our behalf about what kind of fees they would charge at what time. So I asked them to be very clear about a timeline, what fees, and what product comes from it. So that's what you have there. Um, what we, um, I think, I think what we kind of had some miscommunication on is the term plan because there's a lot of things that you can plan here. You can lay out a plan in your grant application, the first phase, and and, and that has a fee with it of $4,800 if the EDH does it. Um, the first year of this project um, is a, it, it's a grant, it's on a reimbursement basis, so I guess it's to be clear on what the city would um, need to be prepared for it would be a hundred percent reimbursement but it is reimbursement so you know managing if cash flow is an issue you know that that's the, the, the system um, if you get through that first year of the, the planning process and it includes um, some of the physical sides of things but also this element of education um, Engineering addresses the physical infrastructure, education, enforcement, encouragement. That's kind of, I guess, your, your marketing of your community and, and encouraging people to be active and um, evaluation. So all of those elements are included in that first year plan. You can use that to be your application to KDOT for that phase two of implementation, but know that it's on page two in November. As you go into that phase two of construction, they will um, ask for $25,000 in design fees, and that's something EBH would, would charge that would not be reimbursed by safe routes to school. That leads to a $200,000 grant from the state of Kansas um, and it's an 80-20 match so for the $200,000 that the state of Kansas would provide the city would also be, um, be asked to, you know, would, would have to match the con 40,000. They said plan 40 or 50,000, really. So over the course of three years, 79,000. We just want to be clear about what would be ahead if we did this. Okay, so to apply for the grant, we don't need to do any money. Well, they no. That's what that's what we were a little taken aback by. They are asking for $4,820. So Here's what Sydney and I have talked about them, to them with them about because we we feel like we're pretty well positioned to compete for this. We're already a part of the Healthy Communities Initiative. We've been having organizational work for the last year anyway. Um, we have a fair amount of experience in grant writing. Um, we just had our third birthday as economic development, so I just tallied up how much grants we've we've pulled in: eight hundred thirty-five thousand seven hundred thirteen dollars worth of grants in the last three years. So I feel like between the combination of having some, I don't know, comfort in writing grants and the idea that we've already done a lot of the groundwork for this type of thing, we can probably prepare that comp that application ourselves. Um, and the EBH had said that they'll be cooperative with that, which leads us to the idea that then they would be doing the contract work for that phase one of which KDOT would reimburse all of that. So what would, would lead the city to be a part of is the um, $25,000 for design. So they'd basically be laying out maps of the town and, and laying out here's what's involved in improving 
the walkability of your town and what infrastructure improvements are needed and so forth for that 25,000. And I think I've also come to realize that there's a little bit difference between design and engineering because there's also going to be some engineering in within phase one where they do more precisely survey and so forth. But nonetheless, I feel like I have to ask them, what are you going to charge for and when? 25,000 design leading into phase two when they actually then would start construction. And that would make it a 250 240 to 250 thousand dollar city improvement project, of which the city would be responsible for 40 to 50 thousand. 20 percent of whatever it ended up being. Right. Plus the 25,000 20, plus 48, 20. But we're, if we do the, the plan, if we do the application within the economic development office, you wouldn't be paying 48, 20. Okay. Well, my first question is: Is can we just give a 25 thousand dollar contract to an engineer? Isn't that something that should be competitively bid? I mean, I'm assuming EBH is not the only engineering firm out there that can do this kind of stuff. There are other firms that are at least doing, I don't know if they're doing the engineer, they're doing the design. Um, there's one in Missouri I'm familiar with that could, um, I think they're less familiar with the city than EBH is. And by statute, I'm thinking, and I will have to check this out, yeah. a city of third class may not be held to that in the same way that a city of second and first classes. Do you, are you familiar? Yeah, no, I was going to say the same thing. There's a, there's a statute that says the minimum for our size city uh, as to what we can do without a bid. Without taking, without taking competitive Going bid. out and, and I don't know advertising the and all that. Yeah, that doesn't mean if that's something the council would want to do outside of the statute, that, that's up to you guys, but as far as the statute, I'd have to look at that to make sure what that dollar amount is. So am I correct to, you know, assuming it's going to cost us $25,000 to be able to get a map of how this is going to work in, in all their guidelines, correct, before any construction? Right. Right. You just have you have to have the plan with the construction plan. Well, I understand that, but the way so, I understood it, a lot of this entails like six foot wide sidewalks and other things. I think there'll be a huge amount of outcry from the citizens if we start tearing up yards and everything else to put a six foot sidewalk in. Well, it's not going to pay for all the sidewalks around town. I mean, and safe routes to school. It is focused on your idea of getting kids to school safely. So for well, example, to me, the, the, the glaring one is the alley right here where we've had a bike accident before. So you line it up so that kids don't feel tempted to go to school on an alley. You know, you actually line it up so that there's, there's corridors that are marked and they're educated to use them and that kind of thing so that they get to, you know, you'll you'll map it out probably that your priorities are going to be the areas where people are, you know, there's where there's more, or, or where there's more, more activity. So, for example, the rec center here. <laughs> you know, to, for kids to go to school to the rec center, you you have to walk in the street. I kind of call it the crosswalk to nowhere. If, if you look there, there is a crosswalk from the school, or from the library, to a curb. There is no sidewalk on the other side of the street. So those are the things will probably take priority. And I think one of the things that might line us up to be more competitive than other towns in this particular round is the whole idea that the school is reorienting the the main entrance of their school at this time. So I think it's a particularly good time to look at how traffic flow is going to be affected and how we might, you know, engineer that so that it's as safe as you can plan for it to be, you know, you just try to make it safe. Um, I mean, we'll, I will probably highlight that in in the application if you if you chose to do that. Um, so it might be, in some cases, it might be the physical construction of sidewalks. And there's other things that can be done like striping so that there is a designated bike lane in, in areas heavily traveled or um, sometimes signage is some of the, the things that are recommended, I'm, I'm told. So, um, it would be 
it would be nice, I think, to try to maximize the impact of this planning by considering that our small town is small enough that we could probably lay out a, a plan that could be implemented over time as funds are available or whatever. Because we are a small town, we could pretty much cover it with this with this program. But I, you're right, $200,000 when you get into building stuff doesn't maybe sometimes go as far as you think. It may, we're not going to cover the, new, the town with new sidewalks. No, I, I'm just saying seems like an awful lot just to get to the point where you have a plan to be able to even look at and an, of an expense of $25,000 that in the end we may or may not do at that point. I mean, well, I don't know. Okay, so here's the, oh, as I was going to say, if I'm understanding you correctly, the $25,000 would come after we knew we had the grant. I think, right, but I mean, okay. We still got to spend that before we actually have the plan and everything else. Right. Right. So to me, that just seems like an awful lot of money. To, to get you, you would be taking those next steps after you knew that you had a grant. But here's the thing we don't want to go through that phase one if you guys know you don't want to spend anything two or three years from now. So I, that's why I'm trying to be very clear about what will happen. Um, if you know right now, you're not going to budget for things in 2017. Or, you know, I mean, I know it could also be a different city council, but what, you know, I, th I just think that it's useful to know what's ahead when you make the commitment to, to phase one. Right, I understand that. My understanding, Karen, or Carolyn, correct me if I'm wrong, that all of these handicap accessible areas that we've already fixed here in the last 10 years will not come under this rule, it'll have to be tore out and redone. Is that correct? I don't think, I don't know. That's what they told us last time. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I will, I will say that what he was talking about was those trunks, trunk, I can't say that word, truncated, truncated, tread, like, 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 yes. like a traction tread. Yeah, and you've seen them, you know, at the time we put those in, with, that was through a, a grant and those were not required. That's why they weren't put in. There's retro fixes for that. There are things you can come back and do to make that. They have them so they epoxy on, you drill an anchor. There's, there's other things you can put in there that will do it. So that's what he was getting at. So I think what he was saying is if, if he came up to, we had a safe route and came up to an existing ramp that was already put in, that maybe the, the state would say, no, it's all going to be brand new, it's going to be six feet wide if that's the way it goes, so that wouldn't work. But I do know there are retro things you can put on these ramps to make that part pass. And if I understood some of what, to address the idea of six foot sidewalks, if I've understood what he's talking about too, he, the six foot sidewalks are the ones that are probably right on your school grounds where there's a lot of kids all at one time. I don't think that that's what is necessarily recommended as you go all through town. They may be wider than what these older types, you know, two foot sidewalks are, maybe more of a four foot, but six foot I know sounds excessive, but I think it's for, you know, immediately right. where there's kids walking and bicycles all at the same time. It's right. still I don't uh, have a specific dollar amount. Right. I did discuss it at the meeting last night, and I'll be honest, the feeling I got from the board is similar to the feeling I'm getting from you guys right now. So, I mean, I heard some conversation about, you know, right around the school grounds, you know, we'd be willing to contribute for that. So, but as far as a definite commitment, there wasn't one. I mean, they are willing to cost share. It's just going to be a question of and if I'm not mistaken, a school board would be limited to cost sharing on the property that the school owns. Yeah, I don't think they could cost share the portion of sidewalk over by the rec center, for example. But they could cost Even share that's to put USD it around the football field, practice field. Yeah. 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 
Well, it, is it the rec center USD 350? It is. It is. So, okay. yeah, yeah, so. But they have more than dollars. The city owns the rec center. The rec center is run by. Yeah. The Recreation Commission, the Recreation Commission, which the school is the pass through for, but I believe the city property is actually. It was donated property, but yeah. it's controlled by the by the school district, by the by the committee of the school district. Or the it always was the no, rec commission. The rec commission is right. The rec building is the controlled by the city. Is, is yes. Take care of that. Right. So you're looking for a commitment so from us. The, the phase one application to the KDOT is due July 18th. And um, it would be the city's application, but we can prepare it. And I guess I'm looking for a um, decision from the city as to whether this is something you want to apply for. My thoughts are financially today, Pass. Anybody else? Well, I mean, I'm all for the safe. I mean, the, the kids' safety and all that other stuff. But kind of like Kevin. I mean, we got to go through the first, the first deal, which you said you would basically do it, so we wouldn't be out any money. But to even get a plan to be able to. To go off of, then we're committed into this grant at that point, and it's going to cost us twenty-five thousand. Correct? You'll get fifteen thousand. Right. First fifteen thousand, hundred percent reimbursed. So, if we get a plan, which is what that fifteen thousand will buy, correct? Yeah, it says available. Right. Yeah. Construction. Okay, so we would have to we would have to put out fifteen thousand dollars, but that would be a hundred percent reimbursed. Yeah, so it's a cash flow issue more than it's an expense issue. Okay, so then as part of that, we would develop the detailed budget, and the plans, and do the resolution of support from from the city, and we would be looking at the twenty five thousand dollars in November of two thousand fifteen. Correct. So we're looking at a year and a half away before we would have to come up with the twenty five thousand, but we wouldn't be reimbursed anything for it, correct? So what would it cost to purchase a plan? I mean, because that's basically what we're doing. If we were just to do that outright without going through the grant. Well that that grant the grant's not covering that twenty five thousand. That's just the, the quote that EDS has given. EDH. 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 Sorry. <laughs> so um that's the cost of creating the map and that's the more the engineering design more than the is that is uh, can i just ask a question i know that we've been talking about some comprehensive planning if we had some type of map and with the technology of technology of today if there could be overlays of our other infrastructures, could that plan be used for other projects as well when we're talking about water and sewer and electric? Is that, I mean, is that a possibility? That that? I'm seeing this construction plan preparation. If you remember, he mentioned, Paul mentioned last time about he was going to check with the county and did, did we ever get an answer? Did they have that electronically over there available or not? The, the man, or uh, Kevin said yeah. last time. Yeah. Yeah. He said, okay, so that was that was going to be a significant saving. This construction plan preparation is what what we're saying it is. It's a construction plan preparation for the project. I didn't take it that other last time the amount we had for that other mapping here, that was an additional cost on my recollection. Anybody jump in if they remember? Yeah, but I think there was an additional cost. So yeah, this is a, you can yeah, you can do this later on as part of this or not as part of this, but I, I think what you're gonna be paying for is construction plan 
to not necessarily get into this other I I go to well, I, my personal opinion is as much money as we spent in the last three years, I think we've got to take advantage of much as I'd like to see something done with some of the uh, sidewalks, yeah, it's very difficult to, to look at that number. And well, I was going to say, if it's just some sidewalks, you know, like the issue on the street, right. I would think we can address that ourselves yeah. for under 25000 bucks and then 70, yeah. I mean, large then another 50000 as well. I mean, I'm, I'm not against building sidewalks. I'm not, I'm not a, yeah, exactly. I'm not against any of that. I'd like to see that. We've spent a lot of number. money in the last three years. Right. So what I'm hearing council say is that at this, at this period in time, we're not interested in extending the grant. That's kind of where I'm leaning towards. Yeah. So you guys all have time now. The other thing that I'd like to um, bring up is that uh, there was a day, I, I loosely I guess called it the daycare task force, but the issue of availability of daycare is one that I hear repeatedly um, as economic development director and think that it's even something that's holding our community back in terms of growth because people who um, want to live here or already do live here are having trouble finding consistent available daycare. So, um, we had a, a, a meeting uh, where I invited a combination of um, businesses, parents. Um, I, hope that, I hope that the city knew that they were invited. Um, the health department was um, not able to be there, but invited. We had some people that have some expertise and day, you know, education, early education degrees that knew some of the requirements for daycare and. I had someone from Great Plains Development there, which is um, regional. We may have worked with them before, but basically they are um, the, the regional place where we can go to um, have federal grants applied for and administered. Um, one way that we might um, look at paying for some um, daycare facilities is through community involvement block grant. And, um, have to show that 51% of your population that you're serving is low to moderate income to do that. In some cases, cities already kind of automatically qualify because of the data of the census. I believe our census that their last showing shows us to be 49% low to moderate income, so we're just off. But you can basically prove that the census is wrong by doing direct surveys. And if you can prove through those direct surveys that you have a population that you're serving that meets that sufficient threshold, then you can qualify for that federal funding. Certainly daycare was kind of what was um, initiating this conversation, but it could apply to a lot of other things from um, water and sewer to community facilities, which could actually be sidewalks too. I mean, we could probably be looking at whether we could be applying for those kinds of things and maybe some of that kind of stuff could supplement you know, some of the other things that we could talk about, but um, community facilities um, can do some housing stuff. So there could be benefit to having that survey done, whether or not we apply it to any particular project or not. It's good for 10 years. So the question is, would the city be interested in hearing from Great Plains Development, which would really kind of be overseeing that, that um, process. She could come to a future meeting and be able to explain the details of that to you better. I can. Didn't we try yeah, and we do did. a survey? With Chris Nagel, when we were looking at all of the uh, energy efficiency, it can't be more than two years ago when we first started with this EPA stuff, we worked with uh, Faye Trent mm -hmm. and um, we sent out all the surveys and we had them send it directly to her so we weren't getting anybody's information and everything and we didn't have enough people respond do any good so uh, you know as, as I don't we can send it again but 
and, and still there's there's all the trying to figure out by doing it and protecting privacy even for us to look at it to know what properties responded mm -hmm. so that you knew who to contact again and ask them to so it's it gets really touchy at that point when you're asking people to talk about their income right. um, I mean I'm open to whatever we could do but I will say that we did do one um, for the housing grant what was that in 04 something like that and that's how we were able to get our blighted area right. and able to do something with that um, so, so you can send it out I mean that's a good I think first step is sending it out with whether it's utility bills or whatever but I, it's my observation from what I've heard is that those who are getting them are actually then following it up with some type of direct contact which takes time yeah. I know it takes time and that's I guess part of yeah with those folks rights. that you know your task force or whatever would you have people that were willing to go knocking on doors in the evening when you're going to take it that out we yeah didn't take it that far but I sense that that's possible there's I think some people that are pretty feels well it, it, it's one of those things that becomes something personal you know how it affects them so I sense that there were some people that were pretty motivated well, I don't have a problem sending, I'm trying to send out a survey and I really wasn't even here to necessarily come to a, a certain conclusion on that but Bay Trent would be willing to come to a future meeting if you want me to schedule it or if you know that you want to okay yeah, why don't you go ahead and schedule it okay. um, maybe first part of August that work for everybody or is that still everybody's really busy doing what as far as I will be finalizing the budget and getting all of that into I mean the budget work will be done It'll be just a matter of publishing and having our hearing. Um, any information that we would gain, we're not looking at the 2015 budget for that. It would be something on out, I assume. The early, I mean, if we had sort of surveys assembled, the, there is an application period in November. I don't know that we have any particular projects, and that kind of even kind of goes into the idea of, you know, I bet it can be amended if something would come up and you, you know, you all would choose to do that. So. But annual, let's annual see. process let's is look at the second meeting in August. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Last item. Penalty of account. Um, and. Well, there was a large account here in town that did not get their bill paid, and there was a penalty, so it's a sizable, a sizable um, penalty. And they were to write a letter for you guys to, you know, to request you to look at that. I did not get that letter. I did not get that email. So, okay. I don't, if it comes in, we'll put it on the next one. I would look for a motion to adjourn. So, um, Thank you.